was suggesting uh, that it could be used for an, an anti, um, uh, not an anti-satellite technology so much as an anti-asteroid or comet-based technology. But all of those things also create a side effect. When you move that much atmosphere up into space, and it's about 30 miles diameter, uh, these columns. So imagine 30 miles in diameter and a couple hundred miles up. Well, below that are pressure systems, high pressure, low pressure systems, and jet streams, all of which can be altered by the manipulation of the ionosphere uh, in this way. And that then creates downstream weather effects that that cannot be modeled, that cannot accurately be predicted, uh, and therein lies uh, huge problems. When you start to manipulate uh, by technology, uh, technology applications to create one effect, you might in a, inadvertently create a number of other effects, as is the case uh, with HARP. Looking at uh, sort of where, is, where are these facilities, you know, here in Alaska, we have one at Gokana, which is about 250 miles. Uh, northeast of Anchorage. Then going across Canada, there's a number of these facilities uh, that are controlled by the Canadian government. Rosalie Bertel has reported on those. Um, then there is uh, one that sits right up here in uh, northern Norway, and this is run by the Max Planck Institute. And then there are five old transmitters in the former Soviet Union. Literally, when you look, they go around the globe. Um, these can be used in conjunction with each other, triangulating to hit the same point, creating unique and different resonance effects and creating even more power. Flipping the planet upside down in Antarctica, China put in a facility a couple years ago uh, to begin working in this uh, technology. And then Arecibo, Puerto Rico um, in the uh, southeastern, uh, off the coast in the southeastern United States also has um, a facility that's been retrofitted. Uh, to essentially do the same thing as HARP. Ionosphere heaters, which are what these were previously called, um, actually originated in the former Soviet Union. People remember them uh, from the 1970s when they created what was called the woodpecker signal, and it was exactly as it sounded. Um, it was this weird static that was rhythmic and coherent, man-made, uh, ham operators picked it up all over the world, and because they could triangulate where it was coming from, they isolated the location of these five transmitters in, in Russia, or the former Soviet Union. And those transmitters were associated with health effects in Oregon, power failures in central Canada, and a number of other anomalous uh, phenomena in the 1970s. Um, and those were the predecessors of HARP. Um, it's the very same technology with a modern twist. The old transmitters would take 15 minutes to reset the frequency because you had to readjust all these antenna. Now, with HARP, it's done in milliseconds by adjusting the software. So, very efficient. You can change things. You can cause them to do different things. It's not a big project in terms of reset. And it's a small expenditure. I mean, HARP, they've spent $100 million on, which in military terms is like cab fare. You know, it's like the, it's, it's not even cab fare. It's the, it's the uh, snowflake in the pile of snow out front you know, that we walk through uh, in the course of all this. But when you look at the impact of each of these technologies that we've touched on today, uh, it's not the same game anymore. These are earth-shaking technologies, the very technologies that will either transform or enslave. Most um, science, at least in the U.S., is developed, most of the high science anyway, is developed through military research labs, military contracts, and some contracts to the National Science Foundation. But all of the military work um, and much of the work done by the uh, National Science Foundation and others are, represent compartmentalization, separation of the sciences in small bits and pieces. So basically one side doesn't know what the other is doing. In fact, the first uh, paper I ever presented uh, at 19 was on the contrasting sort of our approach of compartmentalization uh, in our approach to science and the Russian approach, the Soviet approach at that time 
which was to use generalists, take people from all disciplines, integrate them into the same room so that you could develop the higher ordered thinking. Because then you brought all of these various disciplines, even when they didn't seem to fit, you brought them together and they tended to feed off of each other in a way that built better and more co comprehensive science. In fact, as it relates to electromagnetic exposures, the science developed in the Soviet Union said, and they set the regulations, not that they enforced them, but they at least had them on the books, they were a thousand times more stringent than the U.S. standards in the same areas because of that integrated approach. When you look at the productive capacity of the USSR during the Cold War, they couldn't produce their way you know, into an outhouse. Uh, it was a mess. But what they could do is compete on science. And the way they competed on uh, science with us and were able to not only excel in some areas, surpass us in others, and stay up with us in most, was by integrated science as opposed to compartmentalization. It's cheaper, it's more efficient, and it yields usually better results. On the U.S. side, we do the opposite. We continue that model of compartmentalization to the detriment of really good science and at a huge, huge economic cost. Um, the duplication within that system, the cost of man hours within that system, and the waste that's created in that system. Now, what does that all mean in the broader context of, of global science? You know, the, the U.S. spends in the regular defense budget somewhere around $700 billion a year, which is a big number. Uh, you know, we've got a couple wars going on on top of that. The Chinese spend about 70, 80 billion is what our intelligence uh, tells us, uh, at least that's what's publicly released. When you run inefficient science, and the Chinese don't run inefficient science, they steal everything they can that's already been developed and then take it from there. And they do it at, uh, at rice bowl wages. You know, they're not paying top flight scientists quarter million, half a million a year in salary and benefits. And uh, they're not paying Davis-Bacon wage rates to build ships. Uh, they're building them for a bowl of rice. And what you get in China for $70 billion is what you get in the U.S. for probably far in excess of what we actually spend because you can't measure it in, in, in dollars or currencies. You have to measure it in productive output. And what the Chinese are doing with their productive output is making sure that they can move millions of men and women in their armed services anywhere they want to put them on the planet. <laughs> That's what's going on there. The, for every ship they build, we think about it <laughs> because they actually build hardware uh, and they build it uh, faster than virtually anyone on the planet. And, and, it's, and it's causing a, a lot of concern because when you start to think about um, how does all this play into the, the geopolitics of the planet, climate change and energy and the issues that we've been talking about the last couple of days, they really do fit together. You know, China is moving to energy independence. At the, they're building a, uh, a coal to liquids plant every 18 months from start to finish. They have so many planned online, their objective is, is to be free of the West in terms of contributions to basic natural resources. And what are they doing with all the trillions of debt, U.S. debt, that they're collecting? What are they doing with all the dollars that they're collecting? They're going around the world. They're outbidding Western companies by outbidding us on mining opportunities, the venture capital opportunities, the rare earths and mineral opportunities, and all those plays all over the world, they're outbidding everyone. And why are they doing it? Why would you want to hold a bunch of U.S. paper right now that you know is going to be dropping in value? You're better off buying the commodities. You know when the market fell apart and copper hit $1.30, $1.30 a pound, which was the lowest it had been in years? The Chinese bought more then than they ever bought in their history, and they bought it all the way up till it blew through the old record price by 10 percent while the economy is still in the toilet in the U.S. and Europe, and commodity prices are breaking through the roof, and all those investments those Chinese made with all those cheap uh, U.S. dollars, well, they still had a little bit of value, and we all thought they were nuts for paying 10, 20 percent more than the market said those assets were worth. What a deal they made on all those commodities, not just what was already finished. And what does it mean, just copper alone? There's eight days worth of copper in warehouses in the world to fulfill eight days worth of global demand right now today. That's how underproducing we are in that specific commodity. Zinc, nickel are in similar situations where there's very limited supplies on hand. Rare earths, it's even worse, and all of those are controlled by China. When you start to think about 
earth penetrating tomography as a technology for locating underground mineral resources as an example oil and gas resources some of that technology was tested and it was tested um, in over 20 states on a number of wells that were drilled by Halliburton back uh, back in the 80s and, and into the 90s and what they looked at was using a very simple method of earth penetrating tomography they were able to look and with with absolute 99.9% .9 accuracy grade and quantity and quality of oil and gas layers through the earth matching up perfectly against actual drill logs from when they physically drilled those wells using this type of technology now imagine and remember what we were talking about earlier about the public owns energy resources in most instances in Alaska in all instances are publicly owned but if you could with certainty image the underground geologic structures and know exactly where oil and gas is now you no longer have risk associated with the drilling activity which is why everyone says you know we ought not to be in the energy business but when you can define where those deposits are then you can maximize or optimize what you get on the lease because now everyone has good information people want to bid on that lease competitively you're going to optimize the public's return on those resources so using our technology for doing some things maybe makes a lot of sense but there's lots of ways to do earth penetrating tomography and identify those mineral resources oil and gas resources harp is one of those technologies that perhaps we could use in this way when Skylab launched the first time we realized that uh, back in the 70s we realized that it created a, a hole in the ozone layer and everybody watched it you know and they said oh after a few hours it all filled in and everything went back to normal but think about this now I mean think about it as a practical matter the earth is turning you make a hole everything's moving eventually it gets filled in or it appears to get filled in maybe it did maybe it didn't think about um, if I dip a cup of water out of a pond you know and all the water levels back out did it fill back up well if I keep dipping those cups of water out of that pond eventually there is no pond um, but it sure looks flat and level with just a couple dipped out so what was it you know and I thought Skylab creates an ozone hole how many billions of cans of aerosol would have had to get up there and it didn't start down here you know it started up there where you actually delivered particulate material to the place that you're trying to affect and created a chemical reaction 3,000 satellite and rocket launches over 3,000 worldwide did more for the ozone depletion on the planet I assure you than all the air spray that everybody <laughs> ever discharged uh, and again nobody takes any responsibility blame it on the guy with the with the aerosol can well, governments stand back and go, we didn't do anything here.